is it possible to design standardized tests that do get, that are useful to college admissions? Well, they, they already exist. The SAT is highly correlated with many aspects of success at college. Here's the problem. So maybe you could speak to this. The correlation across the population versus individuals. So, um, you know, our criminal justice system is designed to make sure, um, well, it's 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 still there's tragic cases where innocent people go go to go to jail, but you try to avoid that. In the same uh, way with testing, it just it would suck for an SAT to miss genius. Yes, and it it's possible, but it's statistically unlikely. unlikely. So the so it really comes down to yeah do which piece of information maximizes your decision making ability so if you just use high school grades it's okay but you will miss some people who just don't do well in high school but who are actually pretty smart smart enough to be bored silly in high school and they don't care and they their high school gpa isn't that good so you will miss them in the same sense that somebody who could be very uh, able and ready for college just doesn't do well on their SAT. This is why you make decisions with a, taking in a variety of in, in information. The other thing I, w I wanted to say, it, I talked about when you make a decision for an individual. Statistically, for groups, there are many people who have a disparity between their math score and their verbal score. That disparity, or the other way around, that disparity is called tilt. The score is tilted one way or the other. And that tilt has been studied empirically to see what that predicts. And in fact, you can't make predictions about, about college success uh, based on, on tilt. And mathematics is a good example. There are many people especially non-native speakers of English who come to this country, take the SATs, do very well on the math and not so well on the verbal. Well, if they're applying to a math program, mm -hmm. the professors there who are making the decision or the admissions officers don't weight so much the score on verbal, especially if it's a non-native speaker. Well, so yeah, you have to try to, in the admission process, bring in the context. But non-native isn't really the problem. I mean, that was part of the problem for me. But it's the the anxiety was, which it, it's interesting. It's interesting. Um, <laughs> oh boy, reducing yourself down to numbers, but it's still true. It's still the truth. Well, it's a it's a, it's a painful truth. That same anxiety that led me to be. Um, to struggle with the SAT um, verbal tests is still within, within me in all ways of life. So maybe that's not anxiety. Maybe that's something, um, you know, like personality is also pretty stable. Personality is stable. Personality uh, does impact the way you navigate life. Yeah. Uh, there's no question. Yeah, and and we should say that the G factor in intelligence is not just about some kind of um, number on a paper. It also has to do with how you navigate life, how um, easy life is for you in this very complicated world. So personality is all tied into that in some in some in some deep fundamental way. But now you've hit the key point about why we even want to study intelligence. And personality, I think, to a lesser extent, but uh, that's my interest uh, is is more on intelligence. I went to graduate school and wanted to study personality, but uh, that's kind of another story how I got kind of shifted from personality research over to intelligence research because it's not just a number. Intelligence is not just an IQ score. It's not just an SAT score. It's what those numbers reflect about your ability to navigate everyday life. It has been said that life is one long intelligence test. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and who can't relate to that? And if you doubt, see, another problem here is a lot of critics of intelligence research, intelligence testing tend to be academics who, by and large, are pretty smart people. Mm -hmm. And pretty smart people, by and large, have enormous difficulty understanding what the world is like for people with IQs of 80 or 75. It is a completely different everyday experience. Even IQ scores of 85, 90, you know, there's a popular television program, Judge Judy. Judge Judy deals with everyday people with everyday problems, and you can see the full range of problem-solving ability demonstrated there. And sometimes she does it for laughs, but it really isn't funny because people who, who are... are there are people who are very limited in their life navigation, let alone success, by having, by by not having good reasoning skills, which cannot be taught. We know this, by the way, because there are many efforts. You know, the United States military, which excels at training people. I mean, I don't know that there's a better organization in the world for training diverse people, mm-hmm. and they won't take people with IQs under, I think, 83 is the cutoff because they have found you, they they are unable to train people with lower IQs to do jobs in the military. So one of the things that G-Factor has to do with is learning. Absolutely. Some people learn faster than others. Some people learn more than others. Now, faster, by the way, is not necessarily better as long as you get to the same place eventually. But, you know, there are professional schools that want students who can learn the fastest because they can learn more or learn deeper or you know, all kinds of, of uh, uh, ideas about why you select people with the highest scores. And there's nothing funnier, by the way, to listen to a bunch of academics complain about the concept of intelligence and intelligence testing. And then you go to a faculty meeting where they're discussing who to hire among the applicants. And all they talk about is how smart the person is. 